what you do in our community is not anything that you can think about. But at the same time, small businesses often fail, and some within uh, very short periods of time. And more often than not, it's because those who begin, begin with a dream, but not necessarily with all the tools to be successful. And so I hope that events like this, workshops like this, that bring you together, not just to uh, listen, but to share and to uh, build networks with each other, will contribute to the success of your businesses. I also want to welcome two sponsors from Oak Ridge Bank and from Sanchez Bank who are here with us today. This is an opportunity for you to have some face-to-face -face time with Banker uh, without the stress of getting your business plans together and making an appointment and going in from the office. So I encourage you to take, uh, take an opportunity to, to talk with them and to see how you may uh, benefit from the resources that these organizations have. Again, I want to welcome you to the campus. It is a cold city day, so I won't tell you if you're a visitor to take some time to run around and see uh, what our campus is like, but I will invite you to return in that time. This is a beautiful campus. We are proud to be a part of the community. We're celebrating our 125th year this year. Did you know that you've been around so long? We're very proud of it. And so we are very happy to be able to collaborate with uh, our community to present this workshop. Welcome and have a wonderful, successful day. Thank you so much, David Gill, for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, welcome our attendees today. Uh, since we're sort of light on numbers, uh, a lot of times it can be very challenging for uh, individuals to spend two days out of the office and away from their businesses and running their businesses. And uh, not only that, uh, some of us may have uh, wakened this morning to the torrential downpours and say, oh no, not going to be pretty. So uh, thank you all for braving in and coming on out and we have a beautiful day ahead of us. Uh, the schedule or the agenda is going to be as such as to where the ready module uh, which is the first module in the SBA Business Smart Toolkit will be presented by myself. Uh, we'll have Mr. Jeff Nager uh, with uh, SunTrust Bank, uh, and he's also a board member of the National Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders, come forth and do module number two. Since we're a little bit light on numbers uh, today, what we're going to do, we sort of abbreviate the schedule. <coughs> Tomorrow, it'll likely be a, a more significant turnout because uh, a lot of folks were more interested in the 8A certification. So we will do a refresher tomorrow morning on what you will get today if you decide to come back tomorrow. But you still will get every bit of the 8A certification process and that bit of education and training. Uh, so we want to make sure that we get all bases covered. So with that being stated, I'll go ahead and move directly into the presentation. This is my bio. Uh, I've been uh, in the uh, private capital markets and legal and finance uh, industry for 25 plus years. Uh, more than anything else, uh, my skill sets are the ability to educate and train. Uh, what Smith Group does is we primarily look at, uh, in our practice of being a business advisor and a consultant, we help folks identify the right business structure, define the right strategy, and we help you grow and develop your leadership. And we do that in one specific and dynamic way. And that is we customize corporate level education and training to meet the needs of small to medium sized businesses and we do that education and training through interactive education and learning skills. So we take the approach that if you tell me I'll hear it, if you show me I'll see it, but if you involve me I will learn it and it will resonate with me. So we do that quite well and it's certainly a privilege and an honor to be able to bring those skill sets and those case studies and those years of experience uh, to the uh, North Carolina a t State University. And then again, on the back end of that, once you are ready and prepared, we provide for direct access to capital for business sustainability over the course of time. I'm also on the uh, Board of Advisors uh, for the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation that is just being launched here at North Carolina a t State University. So it's a privilege and an honor for me to be able to contribute. Let's talk about the Small Business Administration's mission. 
The U.S. Small Business Administration is a federal agency that was created to aid, <coughs> counsel, and assist and protect the interests of small businesses. In the context of that, the SBA Help Americans start, build, and grow businesses through an extensive network of field offices, partnerships with public and private organizations across the entirety of the USA. You can find them at sba.gov. This is Smart Workshop Overview. What this is designed to do in intent and nature is to allow for you to gain a basic understanding of the key steps to getting your business off the ground. More importantly, learn what banks look for when lending money. Uh, you'll hear uh, certain phrases such as the five C's, and, and, and that is relating to credit. Uh, we'll have someone speak a little bit about that uh, from the Bank of Oak Ridge this morning. you learn about the various financing options. What are your options in terms of financing a business? Learn about the local resources available to assist you in starting and growing a small business. The workshop is designed over three modules. It's called the Ready, Set, Go. That will help you in every phase of, uh, of ideation or concept phase all the way through the, to the literal launch of your business case. The Ready module covers what you need to do before ever opening the doors of your business. There are the key steps to help when you start and maintain your business. Introductions in the form of who is in business, who has ever owned a business, and turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself and quickly share your idea or concept if indeed you have it, uh, an option. We'll give you a quick second to do that. Okay, as you can see, there is uh, a myriad of different concepts and ideas uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship and, and what your future vision and desires and goals may be. So obviously, there is no shortage of opportunities as it relates to the thoughts and concepts that one can come up with that may be either a lifestyle company, if that's where you choose to position yourself, or if your vision is larger than that, you can position yourself to be a company that may be iconic at some point in time in the future and create legacy transfer of wealth as well as the ability to change lives in a dynamic way by bringing to the marketplace opportunities to offer for economic development, employment, and, and other goals and objectives along those lines. America is a nation of small businesses. There are over 28 million small businesses in the marketplace as it stands right now. Nationally, uh, again, 28 million small businesses, over three quarters of small businesses have no employees. Small businesses make up 99% of the U.S. employer firms. They create 63% of the net new private sector jobs, employ 48% of private sector workforce, and make up 98% of the firms exporting goods. Now, those numbers may seem somewhat generic when you look at it. However, there's something larger at play. It's called the economic base multiplier. When you look at the term economic base multiplier, what that basically means is this right here. For every standing job, there is a service related or service capacity job that supports that job. I see Mr. John Green in the audience today. He is a general contractor and does great work. He's built a lot of the structures that you see around here on campus. So for every one of his construction workers, there needs to be someone that's going to provide his workers for lunch. There needs to be someone that's going to do their dry cleaning. There needs to be someone that's going to sell them their work boots and the other equipment that they need to do on the job.
So it's not just always that one singular job that you're looking at when you look at the economic based multiplier approach when it comes to the impact that small businesses can have throughout the marketplace around the country. And it's very, very serious and it has a great degree of strength behind it. What can impact small business success? A lack of planning, poor management skills are the two most challenging issues for a small business to start with. Poor credit, not enough money, a failure to seek outside help, a lack of resources, lack of support, ignoring the customer, and a lack of experience, and then lastly, poor cash management. These are the four most reasons why most businesses fail. Dr. McEwen, Dean McEwen stated that in a short order of time, most businesses fail. If you look at it, the numbers show as of recently that 60% to 70% of most businesses fail within the first three years. Now, out of that three to five year period, if you add an additional two years to that, then you get up to 85 or 90%. So the numbers break out that almost for every 1,000 businesses that start annually, year over year, there's only going to be 40 of them that remain at the end of a seven to 10 year period. So the SBA is providing for a tremendous wealth of resources in order that you can be sustainable. Great banking representatives, such as we have in the room today, can help you navigate those waters from a fiscal perspective as far as sound financial management, as well as the ability to understand how to gain access to a support network. Your support network are your accountants. Uh, your support network are also your social media or web designers. Most bankers have access to those folks because they have accounts at their banks. And your support network is extremely important when it comes to business sustainability. Ten talents that drive entrepreneurial success. Number one is focus. Number two is confidence. Number three is being a creative thinker. Number four is being a delegator. Number five is determination. Six is being very independent. Seven, a knowledge seeker. Eight, a promoter. Nine, and I would likely say that number nine could very easily be moved into the top five, a relationship builder and a risk taker based upon Gallup's assessment of 2,500 entrepreneurs. Now, let's look at something that I often speak to when we talk about being a relationship builder and the ability to understand how important that is when it comes to the success of your business. Everything in business is relationship driven, whether that is a relationship between the founder or, and or CEO of the company and the employees, or whether that relationship is between the founder and the CEO and the marketplace. If you do not have strong, trusted relationships, your business will fail rather quickly, simply because at the end of the day, there are intellectual properties, talents, and skill sets that you need that you don't know that you need when you first get started. And those relationships will help you be sustainable over the course of time. Are you ready to be an entrepreneur? We're going to ask yourselves a few questions. What do I want from this business? That's the first thing you should ask yourself. And we often train and educate on begin with the end in mind. When I engage a lot of startup entrepreneurs, I say, okay, what's your exit strategy? Well, I don't have one. I just want to run a sustainable business and make some good money. Successful entrepreneurs begin with the end in mind. They have an exit strategy the day that they start the business. They know how long they're going to be in that market segment. They know exactly pretty much what the overall revenue that they may want to grow to the capacity of that business to be over the course of time. And with that being said, they set themselves up to exit at the time frame in which they went into the industry or market segment. When you sit down with most bankers, the first thing that they're going to ask you, especially if you use your own cash to start the business, is when did you pay yourself out? Well, I, I've never really paid myself out. I just keep putting money into the business when I need, need to put money into the business. That's a red flag for a banker because at that particular point in time, he's a little bit concerned about why they should invest in you 
because if you're that risky with your own money, they're going to perceive that you're likely to be that risky with their money as well. However, I've never seen a situation fail to get a loan approved, either at the SBA level or even at a higher level of commercial banking, when that individual can state unequivocally, I paid myself out within 18 months. I paid myself out within 36 months. At that particular point in time, at that point, the company is at break even and debt free. Owner's equity is already paid out and the return on investment is there. That banker is a lot more confident now because he knows that you were well planned and well managed in how you manage those finances. Now, let's take a look at getting ready, steps to starting a small business. Number one, you need to determine your offering and the market demand. Number two, understand your competition. Number three, determining your marketing strategy. Number four, determining your startup costs. Number five, meet your legal requirements. Number six, prepare yourself financially. Number seven, develop your business plan. And number eight, get help. I would lend myself to say that when you're looking at these eight steps that are necessary to getting started, number two, number three, and number four are extremely important. And here's the reason why. Most of the time, when I ask a small startup business, who is your customer? The red flag goes up for me when they say, well, everybody's my customer. Everyone likes my product or service. At that particular point in time, I clearly know that you don't really understand the market segment or the business you're about to get into. And then, even for those that are in attendance today that are currently participating in my entrepreneurship business development training program, we've gone over, over the last couple of sessions, understanding your buyer persona. You should know exactly who and what your customer looks like, where they live, what their lifestyles are, what their buying preferences are. You should know every aspect of that in terms of knowing who your customer is. If your customer is an African-American female with an average median income between ninety dollars and $120,000, she has two kids, she has a career opportunity, her annual earnings is maybe $130,000 on the upside, or maybe she likes going to Starbucks at Tuesday mornings at 8.30 precisely, and she likes the mocha frappuccino with cream on top. That's how you well you should know your customer. Because if you know your customer that well, you understand invariably what their buying signals are. You know exactly what your value proposition should be in order to position yourself in front of that customer at the time in which they're ready to make a commitment to buy. That's exactly how well you should know your customer segment. Beyond that, even with your competition, you should know your competition's business better than they do. You should understand exactly what their annual revenues are. You should know exactly what their strategic marketing objectives are. You should know exactly how they're positioning themselves in the market so that therefore you can either partner with them when you need to partner with them or on the other side of that coin, you can know exactly how to outdistance and outpace them based upon your value proposition versus their value proposition. So don't ever underestimate or discount the importance of understanding your competition knowing your marketing strategy, and number four, determining your startup costs. Because the banker's going to ask you that. He's going to say, okay, tell me a little bit about how much it's going to take you to start this business. They know, because you're not the only one that's ever showed up in front of them to apply for a business loan. They know the industry just as well, if not better, than you do. So if you give a number that they know is completely off base, they're going to ask you to come back and see them at a later point in time. If you say it's going to take me maybe forty dollars to $50,000, they're going to shake their head, especially if they know it's going to take $150,000. The one thing that we understand as investors in the private capital market space, especially in the banking industry, it's going to take you twice as much as you think to start the business, and it's going to take you maybe two to three times as long as you think to pay us back. So with that being the understanding, we know what those numbers are, and we look at KPIs, key performance indicators, in order to know industry standards about what risk to take when we invest in you and when we look at being able to loan you money. Getting ready, determining your offering and the market demand. 
The best business ideas come by identifying a need or solving a problem for customers. Ask yourself, what do I want to sell? What will the product or service do? What problem does my product or service solve? How is it different from what currently exists? Who will buy it? How do I know? And how will I find out? How much will they pay for my product or service? This is what you need to know. And at the end of the day, you need to understand it from the customer's perception. When you look at it purely from your own perception, it's not a realistic approach to whether or not you're going to be successful in your business. Because the customer is going to buy your product or service for their reasons, not yours. They're going to allow for you to solve their problems and needs, not yours. And at the end of the day, when you want to understand how is it different, when we look at what we call the uh, force, forces analysis, that is new entrants, buyer's demand, supplier's power, as well as the market competition, you need to understand very well what exists in that industry. What are the standards in that industry? How do I compete in this industry in order to be successful? And when you look at those four forces analysis, you should be able to understand where you can leverage your opportunities for a competitive advantage, whether that is with your suppliers, whether that is with your buyers, whether that is with a new entrant that's coming into the marketplace. Look at where you are. Whether you are upstream in the value chain or downstream in the value chain, there are always opportunities to partner up and down in the value chain in order to create a greater competitive advantage for yourself, especially if you're a small business that are lacking great resources. So it's an opportunity for you to look at how do I make my value proposition better in the eyes of my potential clients or customers. Understand the competition. Who's already providing the product or service? How much do they charge? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Who are their customers? And what types of customers are they targeting? One of the things that I love to coach and educate and train on is what we call secondary and tertiary phase customers. You should be looking beyond just your customer and say, okay, who's my customer's customer? And then even beyond that, who's my customer's customer's customer? If you can figure that out in your business, you know exactly how to position your sale proposition to your potential customers. Because not only can you bake into the cake, so to speak, the value proposition for your customer, but you can bake into the cake how they serve their customers. So you become significantly more valuable to your potential customer because you're helping them serve their customers' needs. And if you do that, you will always have a consistent and successful business. Determining your marketing strategy. Which customers will I target? What are their problems? How will the customers find out about my business? How will I reach potential customers? What sets my business apart from the competitors? How much will I budget for marketing? We just went over that in my group uh, for the business development and entrepreneurial training program. We just went over that in session number four. And what we know and what we understand is this right here. There are over 113 different marketing channels that a business can pursue, should they choose to. However, there are only five direct marketing channels that are relevant to you and your particular customer as far as your business is concerned. So, you need to understand how do you position yourself through those five marketing channels relevant to your business relevant to the industry, relevant to your market sector in order that they will choose your product or service. You need to balance that through what we call an integrated marketing plan. And that is in the form of social media, if that is the best way to reach the customer. That is in the form of SMS text messaging. That is in the form of email campaigns, especially what we call inboundy. There's a marketing trend out there now called inboundy. And that is you target all of your marketing programs to create inbound traffic driven directly to your website or to do a CTA, which is a call to action, to request them to engage you. If you're not baking that into your marketing channel uh, 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 approach, it's likely that you're missing the five direct channels to reach your customer. So therefore, you're missing out on an even greater opportunity to drive revenue for your business. 
If you're a small business, it's not imperative that you go out and initially invest in a five to ten thousand dollar website. That's overkill. What you need to do is manage the marketing channels that are specific to your customer segment in order to drive the business to you to where you need to be. Getting ready, determining your startup costs. Before you launch a new venture, you should take the time to estimate the total amount of funds that will be needed. Startup costs are divided into two main categories, one-time startup costs and recurring monthly costs. Depending upon how long it will take before you make your first sale, you should consider how much cash on hand you would need to carry you to your first sale. One of the things that bankers like to see, especially when it comes to your ability to manage your capital assets, is the fact that you have some degree of capital reserves. So when we talk about the one-time startup costs, they understand that in that one-time startup cost, that's basically going to run you anywhere from four to six months. If you, if you underestimate that, you're going to be short of cash. They're also, too, going to look at what you call your variable costs and fixed costs. Which costs are fixed as far as that capital reserve that you may or may not have, and which costs are variable. If, indeed, you are not managing your variable costs very well, then they're going to ask that based upon banking ratios, and they can talk to you a little bit about that, that you should certainly have a certain debt to equity ratio and a certain cash to expense ratio. Those ratios are how they judge you for your credit risk qualities. And when you look at how you manage your cash, this is what they're looking at when it comes to how you go from startup to going vertical. Most bankers want to see what we call a hockey stick. They don't want to see the peaks and valleys as far as what mountains look like. They want to see a hockey stick a continual progression in cash flows and your ability to manage your capital costs. Determining your startup costs. Initial costs may inc include your rent and lease payments, salaries, 